Well, good morning. It's a blessing to be here with you all. Well, as mentioned, my wife and I have come here from the Philippines, where we've been living for the last 18 years with our now, well, seven children, but uh, three of them are in the U.S. Uh, three are married, two are in college, um, and then we have three at home still, and then our oldest is married with his wife living nearby us in the Philippines. But it's a joy to be with you all. It's our first time to Australia, and uh, I can see why so many Filipinos are moving here. It's a beautiful place, and uh, every time we uh, get to travel to a place like this, we kind of imagine ourselves living here as well. We got a chance to see some koalas and kangaroos yesterday and walked all over the harbor and uh, 18,500 steps later. Uh, <laughs> I'm, my knees feel a little bit like jello right now, but uh, we're all right, we're, so we're happy to be with you. You might have seen in your bulletin, uh, the name of this message is, I'm happy you're sad. I hope that grabs your attention. And it might sound unloving, but it actually is loving when you look at it and think about it, as we'll do this morning. So let me start with this question. Well, let me start with a prayer, and then I'll start with a question. Lord, thank you for this privilege to come along, your people, my brothers and sisters, with your word. And those who might be here to visit, Lord, that I can stand before them and explain what you have proclaimed to us. We thank you for your word that saves us who believe in you. We thank you for giving us your instructions how to live this life and how to be more like you. Guide us, Lord, speak through me this morning. Open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts, and bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So it is, is it ever okay to make someone sad? Is it okay to be happy about that? We're going to look at a time when it is okay to make someone sad. It's okay to cause someone to feel deep sorrow if, and here's the if, you lovingly, probably want to underline that, if you lovingly tell them the truth, especially when it moves them to what is called biblical repentance. The Apostle Paul faced that situation when he ministered to the Corinthians, who in their immaturity, their pride, their lack of love, and their many other sins had hurt Paul deeply. Even as he sacrificially served them, they believed some false charges against him. They were leveled against him by some false teachers, and they questioned his motives. They questioned his heart. And he was placed in the uncomfortable position of either ignoring the damage that they were doing or potentially hurting his relationships with them by confronting them. Now, I'm not sure about Australian culture, but in the Philippines and Asian culture in general, we don't like to confront people. And I think that's human nature for most of us, although it seems like there are some people that enjoy straightening you out and putting you in your place. I think Americans have that reputation. And I'm not sure about Australians, if you are like Filipinos and other Asians who would rather not confront and upset relationships. But Paul was faced with that difficulty. Do I confront these people and risk my relationships with them? Or do I let them continue on with the damaging and hurtful words and things that they're doing? Fortunately, Paul loved God and the Corinthians too much to say nothing. He also feared the consequences from God for not telling the Corinthians the truth more than he feared what they would think about him. 
And that's one of the reasons we don't confront people because we're focused on ourselves. We're afraid. It's really called idolatry, how people might look at us. Paul was more concerned about God and loved these people and was concerned about their relationship with him. So as with the Corinthians and Paul, our relationships are damaged when we fail to resolve conflicts and seek biblical reconciliation or restoration with others. And to see how God wants us to deal with sin and make things right, let's examine how Paul did it with the Corinthians. This morning we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 11. I'll, I'll read that in a little bit, but we'll be looking again if you don't have your Bibles there yet. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 11. Just to give you a little bit of context before we get into this passage, Paul's association with the Corinthians began on his second missionary journey. And he spent about 18 months ministering to them. In a sense, he was basically their pastor for about a year and a half. But after leaving Corinth, he heard of immorality in the church, and he wrote a letter to confront that sin. Unfortunately, that letter was lost, so we can't read the content, but it was alluded to, and uh, they received it. Then, during his ministry in Ephesus, he received further reports. We would hope that since they received the first letter, um, the lost letter, um, that they would have responded by, oh, forgive us, and made some corrections. Unfortunately, he received further reports that there was more trouble in the church there, which came in the form of divisions. Additionally, the leaders of the church wrote uh, from Corinth to Paul a letter asking for clarification on some issues. And Paul responded by writing the letter known as 1 Corinthians to them. Unfortunately, there was more disturbing news that reached Paul. He was told of problems in Corinth, including the arrival of false apostles who assaulted his character. And those problems resulted in Paul visiting the church again. You would think with a few letters now, him coming in person, finally, they would perhaps respond in repentance in a godly way, but it did not go well. They did not respond well. They didn't defend Paul against the false apostles and the false teachers. They were not uh, responsive to Paul's teaching. So he left Corinth and went to Ephesus with a heavy heart. Then he wrote them again what has come to be known as the severe letter. This time, Paul was greatly encouraged by their response to this letter. And he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 6 and 7, he said, God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort which He has comforted or was comforted by you, the Corinthians, as he told us of your longing and your mourning and your zeal for me so that I rejoiced still more. The Corinthians' response to being rebuked for their sin gives us a beautiful picture, a beautiful example of the God-glorifying results that are possible when we love people enough to tell them the truth. And our passage today shows us three reasons why we should be happy when we cause people to be sad to the point of causing them godly sorrow. So here's these three reasons. We should rejoice when people have godly sorrow because first, it results in repentance. We see that in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 8 and 9. Secondly, we should rejoice when people have godly sorrow because it leads to salvation. It says in verse 10. And then in verse 11, we have this third reason that we should rejoice when people have godly sorrow. And that's because it produces a desperation 
to make things right. Now before I read this text, bear this in mind as well. We can look at this text, this text as diagnostic. We want to apply this to ourselves. If you find yourself in the situation where you need to repent to somebody, measure yourself against this. Does this describe the way I express my sorrow? Or if someone needs to repent and say they're sorry to you and ask you forgiveness, does their apology and their request for forgiveness look like this? Because this is what we want to aim for. And that Psalm 51 that was read earlier, I believe it was very difficult for Nathan to rebuke the king who could have set off with his head, basically. He did it. And I'm sure that even though he made David sad initially, he was glad. He was glad and happy he did that because that restored David's relationship with God. All right, so listen as I read 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 11. Again, Paul rebuked them and he, he wrote them. He said, for even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a little while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance or a sorrow that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. And like Paul, we should rejoice when people experience godly sorrow because first, it results in repentance. Let's zoom in a little closer now at verses 8 and 9. Because when we feel broken for sinning against God, that leads to changed thinking and behavior. Again, if you're looking at yourself, if I need to repent, is my thinking and behavior changing? Or if someone needs to repent to me, did they just mouth some words? but their thinking and behavior is the same. So listen again, as Paul explained what led to his joy. He said that even though he grieved, he says, now as it is, I rejoice. Using my title, I'm happier sad or worse sad because, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly sorrow. It wasn't easy for Paul to write a letter to rebuke the Corinthians. He knew, as he says, he knew it would grieve them. In spite of that, Paul explained why he wrote this, what's been called the severe letter. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, we can see his explanation of why it was necessary to write that letter. I'm, I like that. I'm hearing some Bibles turn. 2 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 3. I wrote as I did, so that when I came, that is, on his next visit, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you, out of much affliction and anguish of heart. Again, it wasn't easy for him to confront them. I wrote with much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know of the abundant love I have for you. That was his motivation. He loved them too much to be silent. He didn't want them to continue with broken relationships with him with other people, and most importantly, with God. 
And Paul was not a harsh man. He didn't enjoy this. Although you may know people, I've seen people that seem to enjoy correcting and confronting people. Paul wasn't harsh. I don't think he enjoyed it. As he said, anguish and tears, he did it. Sec, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 gives us a glimpse of how Paul dealt with people. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, just establishing that he's not a harsh man. He said in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 7, we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. That's how Paul, as a pastor, as a missionary, as a church planner, felt about the people that he was serving and loving on. And because he loved God and his people so much, he had to speak up and confront sin, even if it caused them to grieve. That the New Testament uses the word grieve 26 times, and it can be translated to cause pain, to cause sorrow, to cause distress. Paul f fully knew, I'm going to cause pain to these people who I was their shepherd. I'm going to cause them sorrow. I'm going to cause them distress, but I have to do it. He was able to confront and grieve them because he was more concerned about them being right with God. That's what we need to keep before our eyes when we do this. He was more concerned about them being right with God than he was with them, about them being angry with him or judging him. Scripture encourages us, to, encourages us to have the same kind of love for each other. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6 says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but profuse. Many are the kisses of an enemy. Proverbs 28, 23 says, Whoever rebukes a man will afterwards find more favor than he who flatters with the tongue. Perhaps the clearest passage on confronting and discipline is found in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. It says, If a brother or a sister sins against you, go and tell them their fault. Between you and him or her alone. You do it in private. If he or she listens to you, you've gained your brother or sister. That's what we want. And that passage comes in the context of restoration. Paul modeled this when he rebuked the Apostle Peter in Galatians 2, 11 through 14. Can you imagine? The Apostle Peter walked with Jesus for years, served him, was one of his right-hand men, and Paul had to rebuke him. That must have been intimidating. Even, even though Paul was an apostle himself, he's one who came later. He said in Galatians chapter 2, 11 through 14, he said, When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before, certain men came from James. He was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with Peter, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? You're being a hypocrite. The point is, Paul called him out. It's interesting preaching this message. I preached this before in the Philippines, and it, perhaps because of the Catholic culture, uh, the nation is mostly uh, Roman Catholic, and they have a very high view of... It used to be the priest, It'd be like God's anointed. You don't say anything. And so if you see a priest in sin, they would say nothing. And even in the church with that culture, they would, if they saw a pastor in sin, oh, we can't say anything to the pastor. Well, we have Paul here saying something to the apostle Peter. We are all 
God's one family. We all need each other. We really depend on each other. We all have our blind spots, every one of us. Some things we just completely can't see. We need to be rescued. Actually, the body of Christ is one of the means of God's grace to rescue us from ourselves and our own sin. We need to bear that in mind. We need to love God more. We need to love people more. And we need to be the instruments he's created us to be to rescue us from ourselves. Well, Paul's regret over writing the letter would soon be turned to joy. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, he says, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. So for a little while, he recognized the pain it was caused and worried about that. But he says, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a little while. And as it is, I rejoice. So what caused Paul to be happy that the Corinthians were sad? The answer is in verse 9. He said, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. So this verse shows us the first reason for us to rejoice over godly sorrows because it, re, it, it results in repentance. A note on repenting. Repenting is not just simply changing your mind or saying, I'm sorry. Or, I'm, or feeling sorry that you were caught or that I was caught. Repenting, according to the Bible, is not only a change of heart, well, it's mind, it's heart, it's life that is seen in the desire to abandon sin and to obey God. We love our sins often. We hang on to them. We need to love Christ more and say, Lord, I love you more. I know this grieves you. I know it's against your ways, your law. Give me strength to hate the sin, to turn from it. Forgive me for the people I've hurt. And then ask them for that same forgiveness. And don't just, it's not enough to just say, I'm sorry, or sad. Some people say, I'm sorry that that offended you. I'm sorry that you're hurt by that. That's not real repentance. It involves taking all necessary action to change our sinful behaviors and thoughts. The same word translated repenting or repent in this verse is translated changed mind in Matthew chapter 21 verses 28 and 29. There Jesus asked, what do you think? A man had two sons and he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And the son said, I will not. But afterwards he repented. In the ESV it says afterwards he changed his mind and went. We can see that the son's repentance was not just of simply changing his mind, but that change of mind moved his feet to go and obey what his father asked him to do. So what caused the Corinthians to respond in repentance? Back in verse 9, Paul tells us that you were grieved into repenting for. This little bitty word here gives us the reason for you felt a godly grief. I guess, you know, I'm kind of confused now. I, mean, I probably, probably wouldn't say this in the Philippines, maybe in the States, but it, it was the real deal. Okay, his... his Sorrow was the real deal. Having godly grief means that you truly feel sorry for the hurt you've caused. It's not, you know, I'm sorry that put you off. I'm sorry that's an inconvenience or you see it that way. You're truly sorry for causing someone pain. John MacArthur commented that they felt a sorrow that is according to the will of God and produced by the Holy Spirit. He added, true repentance cannot occur apart from such genuine sorrow over one's sins. This kind of sorrow is from the heart, and it's felt so deeply that it moves not only our emotions, 
but our mouths, our hands, our feet, and our arms into action. And we're going to see the Corinthians did just that. Perhaps there was a time that maybe you thought you repented and made things right. Because you simply just said, well, okay, I'm, and it's, maybe it was like, this, okay, I'm sorry. Has anybody ever said that to you in that way? You go and express your hurt. They, ah, okay, fine, I'm sorry. Were you feeling that? <laughs> Did it feel like they were sorry? However, even if it was a, okay, I'm so sorry. But you followed that up with, I'm, I'm sorry that you feel that way or or I'm sorry but you misunderstood me I, I, I'm sorry but but that's not what I meant um, or you made some other excuses well I, I spoke to you that way I did that said because you said this or that or treated me a certain way or perhaps uh, I'm sorry that I didn't obey you if, if you were in a position where it's authority uh, because you didn't do such and such if that describes your repentance, then you failed to have a godly sorrow. Shifting the blame to someone else or something else is not a real heartfelt apology. The end of verse 9 reveals another reason that Paul was happy that he made the Corinthians sad. He was happy that he was used by God to stir up a sorrow that led to repentance. Verse 9, we see that it tells us that their genuine repentance meant that they suffered no loss through Paul and his fellow missionaries. Well, that was probably the hardest part of this passage for me to understand what he meant there. So what loss was prevented by the Corinthians making things right? Well, being right with God prevented them from losing rewards, opportunities, and being disciplined. Um, maybe I'm not phrasing that right. Because they were rebuked and because they responded the right way, they didn't suffer any loss. They, they were able to get the rewards that obedience brings. They were able to get the opportunities to serve God that obedience brings. If they would have continued with their excuses and blame shifting, they would have, even doing good things outwardly. You can go out and evangelize and all that and serve God, give money to the church, but if your heart's not right and you've got um, broken relationships, you've got unbroken patterns of sin, we can't expect to be in that constant state and be blessed by God. We can't expect that if we're in a a state of un, or unbroken pattern of sin that God's going to help us understand his word and give us opportunities to serve them. But because they repented, they didn't suffer any loss. They were able to receive the rewards that God wanted to give them as they faithfully served him. 1 Corinthians 3.15 says, If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Another way to say it is if, if when God judges us based on our works, if you're saved, you're not judged for your salvation. You're, you're his. He, you're held firm in his hand. But he will judge how faithful and obedient we are to the opportunities he gives us. And as our work, our motivation, as our heart in doing those things are judged, and it's not for God-glorifying motives, then we'll suffer loss. Though, it says in this verse, though he himself, she herself will be saved, but only as through fire. Or 2 John 8, watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. And if they repent and are right with God, they will not suffer loss and get a full reward from him. So, so far in this first part of this passage, we've seen that we should rejoice when we cause people to have godly sorrow over sin because it results in genuine repentance. Verse 10 shows us the second reason we should rejoice when people experience godly sorrow because it leads to salvation. We should praise God when broken people turn from sin 
because only then can we be right with him. Here in verse 10, Paul contrasts godly grief against worldly grief. He wrote in verse 10, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. He doesn't say this, but I'm sure worldly grief, when it results in death, there's going to be eternal regret. As people reflect on, I mean, just imagine this, the last thing you see before being separated from God is the beauty of God and his goodness and his holiness. Maybe you even thought, I'm his. All right, I'm going to enter the pearly gates, as some of us say, and, you know, I wonder what's waiting for me. He says, who are you? I don't know you. And then that's the last thing you see is that beauty, and you can never see him again. And the, the eternal regret of you know, I know so many. Oh, I, I grew up in a home where I heard the gospel. I lived in a country where I was allowed to own a Bible and go to church. We do ministry in Pakistan, Indonesia, uh, Myanmar, Cambodia, many places where it's illegal to share the gospel. Our people in China, they have to hide their Bibles in some places. Imagine growing up. I know I've got at least 10 different Bibles in my house that meant various versions and stuff. Imagine, you know, having all this privilege in the U.S., they're making much about white privilege. We have Christian privilege. We have, I don't know what you would call it, Western privilege, wealth privilege. Don't waste it. We got these privileges. We, we're sitting in a group of believers right now. We don't have to meet together at one in the morning, hiding and hoping the police don't come in here to arrest us for this. There are going to be some separated from Christ forever, and they're going to regret that they rejected the Gospels. There's going to be people they are going to remember who lovingly rebuked them and called them to turn from their sin, and they said, no thanks, or you Christians are nuts. Or maybe someday I'm going to live my life and have fun, party, and then when I'm older, then I'll, that's when I'll start following Christ. Well, a worldly sorrow is going to lead to much regret, but godly sorrow is, leads to repentance, and that leads to salvation, and there will be no regret because the, the deal's not fair. We deserve nothing. God's going to give us so much, more than we can ask or imagine. Look at the results of godly grief. Paul concludes that those who repented from the heart, says it results in a repentance that leads to salvation. This kind of repentance or turning away from sin to pursue God shows that we love him more than we love our sin, more than we love temporary worldly things more than we love our fleshly desires. This kind of repentance leads us or moves us toward salvation in that it causes us to desire new desires. It causes us to desire forgiveness. It causes us to desire holiness. It causes us to desire to be reconciled, to be right with God, right with others. It causes us to want peace with God. And not only does it lead to salvation, but it leads to a salvation, as I said, without regret. I'm so encouraged to know that despite all the sin that I've committed, all the sin that we commit and we're guilty of, Jesus will not only forgive us, but this blows my mind. He's not only going to forgive us, he's going to reward us. If you think about it, that's crazy. We don't deserve anything. He's so good. We will not regret surrendering to him. And when we stand face to face with him, we'll enjoy his forgiveness, his blessings, his friendship. We'll never look back and long for the sinful filth that we walked in in this world. In other words, we will never regret, regret that we get in exchange or what we get in exchange for our sins. 
in heaven will understand that godly sorrow is a gift and that the rebuke of our sins is the beginning of God rescuing us. I'm sure we are going to find ourselves, those of us who are following Christ, will be in heaven someday standing next to other believers saying, thank you. Thank you for not letting me continue in my sin, letting me continue destroying myself and calling me out because that was a part of what God used to rescue me. And what a blessing to, wow, God used me for that. And sometimes we'll be the one used by God to call others and rescue them if we don't shrink back in fear and worry what others are going to say. And sometimes others are going to love us enough to do that for us. But in contrast to the godly grief, worldly grief, or the sorrow of the world, as it's also called, worldly grief is simply remorse. It's, it's wounded pride. It's self-pity. It's unfulfilled hope. It has no healing power, no transforming, saving, or redeeming capability. It produces guilt, shame, resentment, anguish, despair, depression, hopelessness, even as in the case of Judas, death. That's from uh, MacArthur's commentary on 2 Corinthians. And Judas gives us an example of worldly grief and regret. Great picture, Matthew 27. This man who walked with Jesus for three years, watched him do miracles. Jesus even empowered, this is hard for some of us maybe to get our minds around, but even Judas, God empowered to do ministry. It records in Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 5. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind. He repented, but it wasn't a godly repentance. It wasn't a godly sorrow. It says, he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what does this have to do with us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. He felt maybe depressed. He felt guilty, but he didn't have a godly sorrow. So we've seen that we should rejoice when people have godly sorrow over sin because it results in repentance that leads to salvation. Verse 11 gives us this third reason to rejoice if we'll obey God and cause people to have a, a godly sorrow. It shows us in verse 3 that godly sorrow produces a desperation to make things right. As I said, this is diagnostic. If you need to repent, measure your repentance. Is it like this? Is this how you make things right and show that you're sorrowful? Or the other way around, if someone needs to repent to you, and you're wrestling with, is it real? It should look like this if it's from a follower of Jesus. When you are truly sorry for your sin, you will work hard to fully reconcile with those you've wronged. It says here in 2 Corinthians, the last few verses of this text this morning, 2 Corinthians 11, actually I guess it's the last verse, Paul said, no, I'm going to do it a few more it's cutting off on the top of my page but let me read here verse 11 for see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you but also what eagerness to clear yourselves what indignation what fear what longing what zeal what punishment at every point you have proved yourself innocent in the matter the Corinthians response to being confronted for their sins must have been such a great encouragement for Paul. They didn't respond with half-hearted answers like, well, fine, I, I, I'm sorry already. Can you, can you stop? You know, I said I'm sorry. They didn't make excuses or make minimal attempts to fix things. Their response serves as a model of how we should think and act when we are truly sorry for hurting others or when someone's hurt us. Paul observed in 2 Corinthians 7.11. Let me ask one quick question. 
There is a chain of stores all throughout the U.S. and they're everywhere in the Philippines called 7-Eleven. Do they have those out here? They do? Okay, I hadn't seen one yet, but I use this. This helped my Filipino brothers there. If you need to confront somebody or you need to repent, take them to 7-Eleven. Okay, we want to go to 2 Corinthians 7-Eleven for our instructions on how to make things right. I tell you, it's funny, but years later, people, oh, yeah, 7-Eleven, I remember. That helps me remember if I'm counseling someone, you know, and we need to discuss reconciliation, repentance, 2 Corinthians 7-Eleven. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves. They had a sense of desperation is the way I summarize this section. Desperation to make things right. Paul showed that this was done in several ways. First, he said they had an earnestness. That means they were moved to act quickly to make things right and were diligent to fix the damage that was done. When we have this kind of zeal to make things right, it shows that we are truly repentant. MacArthur states that earnestness is the initial reaction. I, I highlighted in my notes, reaction, because there needs to be action. Earnestness is the initial reaction of true repentance to eagerly and aggressively pursue Righteousness. This is an attitude that ends in difference to sin and complacency about evil and deception. Their sense of desperation to make things right also, not only did it cause them to be earnest, but it also caused them to be eager to clear themselves. Not eager to make excuses, not eager to justify eager to answer for their words and actions with the readiness to make amends. Previously, the Corinthians tolerated the false accusations against Paul. They listened to false teachers and were unloving to each other. And once they were moved to sorrow for their sin, they were eager to undo all the damage they had done. And likewise, we can show our Sorrow, our godly sorrow over our sins by being quick to correct our sinful behavior and thinking and quick to clear ourselves of the offenses that we've committed. This means doing whatever is necessary to make them feel safe, to earn back the trust that we broke or was broken as much as possible on our part. We need to repay, we need to repair whatever damage was caused. I've counseled, sad to say, uh, several couples over the years where adultery was committed. And on top of that, I, I saw this with my own father. And several men who just didn't understand, I said I was sorry already. Why doesn't she, why is she still asking me where I'm at at nighttime? Why do I have to be home so quick? Why, do I, why is she asking for these you know, demands of what I'm doing and maybe she wants me to be there. She just needs to trust me because last night I said I was sorry. Trust has been destroyed. It needs to be earned back. I've told men it's on her timetable. Or if the woman was the offender, it's on his timetable. If you were truly committed to restoration, the consequences of your sin is this pain, this hurt, this lost trust. They've forgiven you. You're in the same home. You're not on the couch. You're not running a flat somewhere else. You're, you're together working on this according to their timetable. Be eager to show your sorrow, not just with words, but with action, with patience, with the time that it takes to do that. Paul also mentioned here, he said, what indignation you have in showing your godly sorrow. They had an anger or disgust over their sins. Originally in Corinth, there was toleration of sexual sin. 1 Corinthians 5.12 says, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and you're proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning? Shouldn't you be ashamed? 
He goes on to say they had lawsuits. There was jealousy. There was fighting. There was division in their church. Before they were unashamed and they were practicing immorality. They were self-focused. But after, when they were confronted because Paul loved them enough to do that. And when God granted them that sorrow, they were convicted. They turned from their sins. They were ashamed of them. They hated them. I don't know about you, but sometimes I have to pray, Lord, I know that sin's wrong. Forgive me. I'm, I'm turning from that. But Lord, help me to hate that sin. Help me to recognize the damage it does because I, I, I recognize it myself. I don't feel as bad as I should. It's not that I'm, I'm not saying we should all walk around depressed and God hates, but I think sometimes it becomes so trivial we don't recognize the damage. You know, for example, if you just thought about Let's say pornography. If you just write, oh, that's wrong. Lord, forgive me. I, I need to turn from that. I'm struggling with that. But if you thought about, wow, that's someone's son or that's someone's daughter. What, what life are they living that they, they're choosing that or forced into that or kidnapped and being exploited into that? What does that do with my heart, my life, my relationships? What does that do to God who wants to use me to glorify him? When we hate our sin and when we have what Paul said here, this indignation over the sin, it's going to cause us to be quicker to run from it and to hate it. Sometimes we need to say, Lord, help me hate this sin. It's too comfortable. It's so accepted in my society that I, I don't recognize how bad it is. Lord, help me to see it with your eyes. They also had a sense of desperation. It says fear. He's, Paul says, what fear? This caused them to have a conviction of their sins, and it brought the fear of God on the Corinthians, understanding this is the one who gives me my every breath and has every right to end me right now. They had a genuine fear of God's judgment and it moved them to live holy lives. It causes us when we recognize, it's so easy, you know, God's my father, he's my friend. Well, yes, but he, he's my judge and he's all powerful and he's just and he's righteous. That fear should cause us to repent, to repair, and to reconcile. Well, after reminding the Corinthians that God is going to live among us, he said in Corinthians chapter 7, because we're going to be his people. He's going to be our God. He's going to be among us seven, someday. 2 Corinthians 7.1, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. This godly sorrow and repentance led the Corinthians to be desperate, to have a longing, Paul said. They, they yearned for their relationships to be made right with Paul and anyone they hurt. They had a zeal, he said. What longing, what zeal. That is, they were enthusiastic about making things right. They were dedicated to reconciling. And Paul was comforted by that. He said in 2 Corinthians 7, 6 and 7, I read this earlier, but God comforted us by the coming of Titus and in verse 7 as he told us of your longing your mourning your zeal for me so that I rejoiced more and then lastly he said what punishment the godly sorrow of the Corinthians made them eager to see justice done even if it meant they had to have punitive or legal damages they were ready to accept any consequences for what they had done we need to have that same heart. They wanted all the wrongs made right, all their debts paid, and all the damages repaired. Paul concluded his praise of their actions by saying, at every point, you've proved yourselves innocent in the matter. And if someone has hurt you, I'm sure, if you have someone eager and longing and broken to make things right, and you see a pattern of that, maybe it takes a little while, if you're a follower of Christ, that's going to weigh on your heart. It's going to be easier to grant forgiveness and be reconciled with them. This morning we've looked at three reasons to rejoice when we cause people to feel godly sorrow. We should rejoice when people have godly sorrow because 
One, it results in repentance. Two, it leads to salvation. And thirdly, we should rejoice when people have godly sorrow because it produces a desperation to make things right. And praise God that he loves us enough to send people in our lives to confront us. If you've been given that grace, bear that in mind. If you need to confront others instead of being afraid of what they might think of you or others might think, go in prayer, Lord, help give me a spirit of gentleness so that I can reconcile with this brother or sister. If there's someone that you've sinned against, go to them this week with this kind of sorrow and repent and say, I want to be right with you. I want to be right with God. I want to prove to you that I am really broken over what I've done. Don't just tell them I'm sorry. Show them you're sorry. Call them. Text them. Meet them. Meet them for coffee, whatever. Don't keep putting it off. This week, make it right. I suggest you even write out a plan of how you can both say and show them your genuine sorrow. Think it through ahead of time and then be ready to quickly and eagerly. And they're going to be, I think, at least some point impressed that, wow, you know, you really thought this through to make things right. And Lord, I pray that you'll give us the strength to do that, to be faithful, to love each other enough that we're not satisfied with seeing each other wallowing in sin or being afraid of men rather than afraid of you. Lord, help us to love you, to love each other enough to speak the truth in grace and in kindness, lovingly urging each other to be right, to be reconciled so that we can receive a full reward and give you the glory that you deserve I pray, Lord, that we would be blessed by seeing fruit from that, that we would see friendships restored, marriages restored, relationships. We would be a godly example to unbelievers at our jobs, at our schools, as they're blown away. Wow, these Christians treat us different than anyone else. They truly are sorry and they want to make it right. Give us the strength the insight to do that, Lord, for your glory. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.